Hello, everyone. My name is Harvey Brownstone, and today our special guest is a lady who first won our hearts as the exemplary wife and mother, Olivia Walton, on the long-running iconic TV series, The Waltons, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Our guest then went on to play Nurse Mary Benjamin on the popular TV show Nurse, winning a total of four Emmy Awards for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Drama Series, which is the highest number of Emmys any actor has ever won. She was also nominated for four Golden Globe Awards for her work on The Waltons, and she's helped to keep the legacy of The Waltons alive by appearing in numerous Walton reunion movies, including A Decade of the Waltons, Mother's Day on Walton's Mountain, A Walton Thanksgiving Reunion, a Walton Wedding, and a Walton Easter. You've also seen her in many other shows, including Hot House, Living Dolls, The American Revolution, Scrubs, General Hospital, The Young and the Restless, and a wonderful movie called Second Acts which won her two Best Actress Awards at film festivals and a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Las Vegas International Film Festival. And I'm very excited to tell you that she recently completed filming Ryan Murphy's brand new miniseries, Monster, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story. I'm thrilled to welcome the beautiful Michael Learned to our show. Ms. Learned, thank you so much for joining us. That's the most incredible introduction I have ever had in my entire life. Thank you so much. Now well, I'm going to walk around feeling, I don't know what, conceited and swell-headed, I guess. Well, you deserve it, and it came from the heart. Well, thank you. Miss <laughs> Learned, you've appeared in our living rooms for so many years that I feel like I already know you. You must hear that a lot from fans. Well, I feel good about it when they're talking about Olivia. And not the uh, nasty grandmother I played on SVU, where I, I think I was pimping out my grandson or some terrible thing like that. But, you know, at, you're an actor and you when a job comes along, especially at my age, you're really happy to to say yes. So you lived on a farm in Connecticut for the first 10 years of your life. So did you draw from that experience when you started playing Olivia Walton? Well, I'll tell you the, the story, which is the true story. I stole money from my dad. He used to keep, poor guy, I feel for him now, but I was young, you know, I was nine, 10 years old. And he had a coin collection of old coins, old quarters and nickels and dimes and stuff. And I would just go into his little coin drawer, not knowing that this was a special drawer for his. And I'd steal a quarter and go buy five candy bars. You could get five candy bars for a quarter in those days. And I would distribute it you know, with my, I'd share with my friends at school and some teacher caught on and called my dad and said, you know, your daughter seems to be spending an awful lot of money on candy and she's kind of handing it around. And I, I just thought you should know about it. So my father confronted me and said, you're too old to spank. So I'm going to make a chart and you're going to have to pay me back. And he did. He made a chart and for every egg I collected, I got half a penny or, and I had to milk three goats every morning and every night before I went to, 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 you know, to bed. And I had to carry up the pig slops and clean out the stalls. I really worked hard and I paid them back. And then I kind of started making money, you know, because and once I paid him back, anything I made, I got to keep. So I thought he did a really good parenting job and I never stole from him or anybody else again. So did you base your portrayal of Olivia Walton on, on anyone in your own family? Was it on your dad? No, I think when you have a role like Olivia, you kind of, you kind of grab it from all of your own life experiences. As a mother, for instance, I adored my children. They were the joy of my life. So I never felt it was onerous to take care of my kids. It was always a joy. And I think you just can't kind of pull from every aspect of your life experience. And I luckily had that farm experience, which wasn't, it wasn't a working farm. It's what the Wisconsin real farmers call a hobby farm, which in Connecticut, they call it a gentleman's farm. There's quite a difference between a hobby farm and a gentleman's farm, but whatever it was, it was, it was beautiful and a happy, happy time of my life. I loved living on that farm. So how much of Olivia Walton is there in the real Michael Learned? A lot, I think. I'm not 
deeply religious, but I believe in God, you know, but I'm not religious uh, per se. So she was very religious and rather rather judgmentally so at times, which I liked. I liked the fact that she wasn't just this perfect do-gooder all the time. So they had, she had her little drawbacks. She could be very judgmental of somebody who didn't agree with the way she saw things. And we, we fought for that, actually. We said, you know, Earl, Earl was writing about his own family. So he didn't want to make any family members, didn't want to hurt any of his family members. So we really had to struggle sometimes to say, look, People don't love you for your perfections. They love you sometimes for your flaws as well as your perfections. So you got to give us some flaws here. In 2002, you wrote an article for a church publication, and you said that at the time you got the role of Olivia Walton at the age of 32, that you had hit rock bottom. What did you mean by that? I meant I was broke. All my animals had died. I was going through a divorce. My children were in, not in great shape and because of the, up, the family upheaval of divorce and everything, and they were teenagers. The divorce happened at a really prime uh, time for kids when they need stability and suddenly their whole, the rug was pulled out from under them because they never saw a fight or anything. So all of a sudden this idyllic marriage was over and they, they kind of didn't know, they didn't know where to put themselves. So... I came down to LA just hoping I could get to know the city so I could come down for auditions and stuff. And I got lucky. That's all I can say is I got lucky. And that's a lot of this business, a lot of highly skilled, talented, professional actors never get the lucky break. And and I did. And I didn't consider it a lucky break at the time. I uh, did not want to be pouring coffee for the rest of my life. And I was sort of a little bit arrogant. Now I look back on it with enormous, enormous humbleness and gratitude that I was given such a gift. I think we all got lucky when you got that role because you became the quintessential mother that everybody wished they had. Well, that was Earl Hamner writing about his mother, who was was a little more crusty, I think, than he wrote Olivia, because I think he felt I'm not maligning Earl's mother. She's a wonderful woman. I'm, I've met her several times. And she's delightful. But um, I think you can't write that every week. I, I, I said to him, you know, Patricia Neal was brilliant in the initial homecoming, which was the, really basically the pilot for the, for the series. And her character was very, very stoic, very uh, opinionated. And we decided that Every week in people's living, they don't want to live with that every week in their living room. You know, you have to show some softer sides here and there. So I hope we didn't soften her up too much, but we did soften her character a little bit. Yeah, I thought it was the perfect blend. The Waltons ran for nine seasons, but you left after season seven. We were told that Olivia got TB and went to a sanatorium, which, of course, was very traumatic for all of us fans. What made you decide to leave the show? boredom I was bored frankly and they really struggled to give me interesting we were just talking about this morning that I went through menopause I went I had a miscarriage I mean they tried to find things for me as an actress to play but it's difficult after a while as the kids got older and they started having kids and everything the I sort of, they wanted me always in the shot. They wanted my presence, but they didn't always give me anything to sink my teeth into. So, you know, I really, I really wanted to move on and I got an offer to do nurse. So basically I just went from playing a mom to playing a nurse. (laughs) Well, when you were making the Waltons, did you have any idea back then that the show would become so beloved and so enduring and legendary? I mean, here we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the show. It's amazing to me. And, and it was to, to, to Ralph. And we never, for, for, I thought, well, this will look good on my resume that I've done because I had done television in Canada, but I'd never done any TV in the States. So I thought, well, this will go on my resume and that'll look, look, look good. And never in a million years did we ever think that it would, it would take on the way it has. And, you know, I think I have to credit Earl Hamner over and over again, because it, what every episode does, it tells a story. It's a story, and Earl was a storyteller. 
he told stories. And the only flaw that we ever found with Earl was when he wanted to make people too nice because he was a nice man himself, you know? And I said, you know, you, you can't always have everybody be so perfect. You gotta have us sometimes make bad decisions or have Olivia scold the wrong child. And so that was a struggle with Earl. So looking back, Miss Learned, what do you think accounts for the show's incredible success and longevity? Family. Everybody Strong. identifies with family. Strong family values, great writing, great acting. Well, thanks for the acting, yes. And, you know, there was a chemistry between all of us. We truly are friends today uh, as much as we were, you know, in the show. We, we truly cared about each other. We, we are a second family to this day. So I think that comes through. I don't think you can fake that kind of chemistry, really. Oh, there's no question about that. And I think you all became family to all of us. That's good to hear. I watched it with my son every Thursday night at eight o'clock. I would watch it with my youngest son, Luke. My older kids were teenagers. They could have cared less, but Luke and I watched it together. And I remember one day I was in the kitchen cooking, you know, getting cooking dinner and the, the music came on and my son, Luke said, mom, when that music comes on, it just makes me feel so happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you have a favorite episode of the Waltons? Well, I love the anniversary because simply because it was really Ralph and my love for each other that showed, showed through on that uh, episode. I can't remember too much about it. I remember, you know, when you do so many shows, they sort of blend into, but I, for me personally, that was maybe my favorite, but there are other shows. We just watched one, my husband and I uh, just watched one yesterday with Verdi Grant and her daughter going to school to school and feeling like she can't compete because of her color. So he took on some really serious issues and it was a very good show. And we were minimal in it, the Walton family, we were minimal. It was mostly about Bertie Grant and her daughter, Lynn Hamilton, and uh, who is a wonderful woman and actress. And uh, yeah, that was good stuff. But yeah, that was a beautiful that. episode. I, I want to take a moment to pay tribute to Ellen Corby and Will Gear, two sensational actors who brought so much to the show. Ellen Corby won three Emmys. Will Gear won an Emmy as well. I think we were all in mourning when they passed away, don't you think? We were, for sure. We did one show about Will's passing and because uh, it happened in the hiatus. So we were, all, we were all in different places. We weren't together when it happened. And uh, that show was very moving to do. And Ellen, you know, feisty Ellen came back after her stroke and she really was a challenge, but uh, she could sit, oddly enough, she could play the piano. She could play, let me call you sweetheart and play the piano perfectly, but she couldn't speak. She could say yes and no, but we had to write out her, her lines as simple as they made them for her. And she worked so hard to get the few words that they would write for her out. But her acting ability without words was extraordinary. Don't you agree? I, I thought she was oh, incredible. She could convey an entire page of dialogue with one look. I'm with you. Yeah. It was her life. Acting was her life. You also got to work with the wonderful Beulah Bondi in two episodes. And she won an Emmy for her performance on the show. What was it like to work with her? Well, I had heard about her. I mean, we were all kind of in awe when she came on the set. She was just the most down to earth, nice, decent person. We also got to work with Margaret Hamilton, who played the witch in The Wizard of Oz, which is my favorite movie of all time. I mean, we got to see and know, and Sissy Spacek, before she became as well known as she is today, we, we worked with a lot of absolutely wonderful people, and they all were as wonderful in life as actors and as human beings as they were on the screen. Of all the roles you've played, Miss Learned, is Olivia Walton one of your favorites? Well, now it is, she, she is. Yeah, I mean, I've done a lot of theater, so I have a lot of wonderful theater characters that I loved to play. But yeah, she's, she was a good friend and I, I, she's, she lives in me. 
Now, in 1994, you appeared as First Lady Abigail Adams, the wife of President John Adams, in a TV oh miniseries God. called The American Revolution. That was a fabulous show with a great cast, including William Daniels, Charles Durning, Cliff Robertson, Kelsey Grammer. Do you have any memories of working on that show that you can share with us? I just remember it was a joy. And it was a, a series that I knew was going to be over. You know, the trouble with the series is when you do a series, it's lucky. First, you're thrilled and full of joy and luck. And, oh, I'm so happy. And then it gets to be a job, uh, like any other job. It's just a job. And some days are great and some days aren't so good. And because you carry yourself with you wherever you go. And if you're having a bad day, you're having a bad day at work. Usually, sometimes they can pull you. The kids used to pull me out of my my down days, uh, the Welton's kids, you know, if they saw I was down, they would crack jokes and be silly and make me laugh. They were fabulous and uh, still are. But yeah, I don't have too many memories of that, of doing that show. I just remember it was, it was wonderful. And Charlie Durning and I became very good friends. Now, before we talk about your latest project with Ryan Murphy, I have to ask you about the beautiful, highly acclaimed short film you made called Second Acts, co-starring John Wesley. It's about a white woman and a black man who fall in love despite the bigotry they grew up with. Congratulations, Ms. Learned, on being part of such a wonderful film. Well, thank you. That's Jerry Pass, who is the producer of that film and is also a wonderful manager. And we never signed a contract, but he's, he's been an angel in my life. So he's resp totally responsible for that film. And I love doing it. I loved working with John Wesley, who's unfortunately passed on. But it was a labor of love. And it's a love story. It's a wonderful love story where two little kids, as you said, uh, weren't allowed to play together because he's black and she was white and her father was racist. And as adults, as older people, old, I might as well say it, as old people, we are able to resume our love for each other. And it's just a love story. I also want to congratulate you on the Lifetime Achievement Award you got at the Las Vegas International Film Festival. That award is so richly deserved. I was thrilled when you got that. Thank you. It means you're really old when you start getting Lifetime Achievement Awards, but I was very grateful for it. Have, I have them all in my study somewhere. They're, they're all around. Um, we tried to put them in the background so you would see that. That's only two, but I have two more up on the shelf. And, you know, every time, you know, when you're not, when you're not up for an award, you kind of, you get excited for people you care about or people you love at, at their work and you want them to get something. But when it, when you're up for it, it's a whole other ball game. And the first time I never thought I would win an Emmy for pouring coffee the very first time, but I had on a Bill Blast dress and I, the hair and makeup people on the show did my hair and, and everybody was all excited. We went in a limo. My son was my date and I just was having a blast because I'd never been to a big do like that. And, and then suddenly they called my name and it was like the end of the world. I thought, oh my God, I have to get up there and talk to all these people. I have to say something. I have to make sense. My knees were shaking. I was looking at my son. We both had, our eyes were this big and it was the greatest thrill in my life. I, I don't even remember what I said. I'm sure I got something out, but I hadn't prepared. I hadn't written a speech. I never thought for a minute that I was even in the running. And the first thing I did was call home and my kids were just jumping up and down. It was, it was really a thrill. And you won three more Emmys after that, Miss Learned. It's always a thrill. It's always nice to win. It's it, especially for nurse because the show was canceled and I thought it was a good show. And it was, it was a difficult show because we were shooting in New York and the writers were good writers, but all in LA. So they were writing things like she goes home and soaks in her hot tub. And you just don't have a hot tub when you're living in Harlem in New York, you know? So there were Robert Reed and I were always trying to, you know, get New York writers. And eventually we got New York writers. There were writers who n knew how to write for New York. And then the show was canceled because I guess they considered us troublesome. So it was too bad. I thought it was a good show. It was a good show. And I remember thinking that the network didn't give it enough of a chance. It was just growing an audience. And then you won the Emmy for Best Actress. If they'd just given it one more season, I think it would have become a juggernaut. 
I wish they had. Yeah, I wish they had, but I guess we offended, uh, uh, Robert Reed and I offended people, I guess, you know, when you, when you are given LA writers and then you want New York writers, somebody's going to be offended. And so unfortunately, we, I, I don't think I handled it as well as it could have been handled. I should have gotten on a plane and come to LA and said, let's go out to lunch and talk. But I, I was a little overwhelmed myself and I, I just didn't handle it as diplomatically as it should have been handled. So I take the blame for that. Well, it's, it's a shame, but you went on to do so much other great stuff. And now, of course, I must ask you about the new Ryan Murphy miniseries called Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story. You play Jeffrey Dahmer's grandmother, Catherine Dahmer. What was it like to work with the brilliant Ryan Murphy? I hardly saw him. And the, uh, he was, I heard that he was on the set one day. And so I went looking for him and I found him and we hugged each other. I said, I feel like I know you because he's worked with so many of my friends. He's made stars out of, you know, relatively unknown actors and actresses, Sarah Paulson, for instance. And, you know, I just said, I, I think you're amazing and wonderful. And I'm so happy to thank you for this. And that was basically it. But when I heard it was a Ryan Murphy project, I was thrilled. And even playing Jeffrey Dahmer's grandma and uh, Evan Peters is a wonderful young actor and working with him was was really a joy but there were some really bizarre scenes there's one where I have a I'm not supposed to talk about it too much so I I, I better shut up I, they've told me I'm not supposed to talk about it, so I won't but I I think uh, I think it's going to be a very good series do you know when it's going to be released no I thought it was going to come out last year September but they're holding it so I don't know I have no idea why they're holding it even. So what were you able to find out about Catherine Dahmer to help you prepare for the role? Well, I watched uh, whatever videos there were. There were a few of her. And I listened to a, a lot of Jeffrey Dahmer himself talking. And I also tried to draw on my own experience with, I have a grandson who's living with us, who's a living doll. I mean, he's just fabulous. And but I thought, what would it be like if I discovered he was a serial killer, this darling, dear, sweet grandson of mine. And in a sense, that's what happened to her. I mean, she didn't know. Denial is a very uh, strong thing, you know? I mean, actually in the, in this, in the show there, they have him bring, he was chopping people up in her basement. How can you not know that? But if you don't want to know something, it's easy to not know it. Now you're in six of the 10 episodes of the miniseries. Have you had a chance to see the whole series yet? Not nothing, no. Wow! So you're going to be watching it along with the rest of us. All I know is I have a, a wig and glasses and schmat, my usual schmata. Just once, I would love somebody to give me a job where they put false eyelashes on me and make my hair look beautiful and make me look prettier than I am. But that's for the award shows. <laughs> Maybe okay. <laughs> Let's hope. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> I have a feeling, without even having seen it that you're going to be up there. You'll be in the running. Oh, I don't know what that would, that would be fun. Would sure be fun. Yeah. I get the feeling, Miss Learned, that you don't really get how beloved and how popular you are and how gifted you are. Well, um, no, I guess I don't. I, I feel that I'm lucky. I've been lucky. But I've also, you know, to any young actors who might be watching this, you know, just show up. You got to keep showing up. And that's what I've done all my life. I show up and, and I got lucky. And also I have to thank a woman who, Ethel Winant, who was the head of casting at CBS. She used to come up to the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, where I was the leading lady and my, my ex-husband, Peter Donat was sort of the leading man. And we were a wonderful company. We were all leading ladies and leading men uh, in that company. We were all equal. And uh, she would come up and see the shows. And I, the story I've heard from another director friend of ours who said she wrestled Fred Silverman to the ground over you. He didn't want you, but she did. And she won. And I'm, I'll be forever grateful to her. She never, ever said a word to me that she did this, that she fought for me. And I'm so grateful. I guess he thought I was too young and I was short blonde hair and they wanted a woman in her 40s with long red hair. It, it's one of those Hollywood fairy tale stories, really. 
Isn't that wonderful that you didn't even know she, she did it all because she believed in you not to get any kind of credit for it. That's absolutely correct. And she never told me we would have, I liked her as a person. I, we would have lunch together and so on. And I never really put it all together until after she died. And a, a, a director who was a mutual friend told me she wrestled him to the ground over you. He didn't want you. I don't want to badmouth Fred Silver because he probably was right thinking she's too young and she's got short blonde hair and we're looking for someone. All the women I tested with had long red hair and were, were in their late 30s, or early 40s. But she fought for me. God bless her. That's destiny. It is really. I mean, there's a lot of that in this business. And uh, I know some of the other actors who tested for it and they were all wonderful. Now, I want to ask you about the atmosphere on the set. I mean, Jeffrey Dahmer truly was a horrible monster who caused unspeakable pain and suffering to so many people. Was there a lot of concern on the set to make the show as respectful as possible to the victims and their families? Well, I I was just, the only scenes I had were with him. So I don't really know. I haven't seen a lot of the other scripts. I, I saw a few of them. And yes, I think, respectful that's an interesting term for these they were lost a lot of them were lost kids they were lost kids in fact we took one kid in our ourselves in our family when i was married to to peter in san francisco his mother was abusing him terribly with cigarette putting cigarettes all over him and things like that and these these kids are are just lost and kind of hopeless so they're victims to anybody who's going to be seemingly kind to them so I think in that sense that comes across in the series of these kids that are just kind of out there and uh, now you've been an actor almost all your life you've worked with so many great people you've accomplished so much do you still enjoy working as much as you ever did more than more than ever Because I have, I'm going to do on Golden Pond this summer in Canada. And and I've worked there before and I love it. I I take my little dog and we have a little house. And I I was going to do it with Hal Linden, but unfortunately, I just heard that he had passed, which uh, breaks my heart. Uh, I worked with him in New York on on Broadway and he was a sweetheart. So I, I, I will be doing it with a Canadian actor named Walter Borden, who's a wonderful actor. And. I'm Where will that be in Canada? It will be in a little town called Petrolia, which is about an hour and a half from Toronto. Yeah. It, uh, I've worked for them at, in Sarnia. They're from Stratford, where there's Shakespeare, the wonderful Shakespeare Festival. And of course, I lived there. I lived in Toronto for years when I was married to Peter, because he's Canadian. So we lived there. I always consider Canada my, my home, because it's where I spent my 30s, you know, my, my young years before the Waltons. I will be in the audience in Petrolia this summer for sure. You Where can, are you? Count you on can that. come back and say hello. Absolutely. I want to ask you, do you think you'll ever sit down and write a memoir? I write uh, sporadically little things and I, I, it's coming up again. So I probably have to sit down and do some more writing, but I, I can only write in essays. I can't kind of write. I'll think of something or now probably I have to start writing about people I've worked with, because that's what people want to hear about, and who I've slept with and who I haven't slept with. Well, I haven't slept with that many people because I get married a lot. You know, I'm always married. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. I, 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 I can't sit and write a book. I'm not a writer. To sit down and say I was born, blah, 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 blah. But I can write little moments that I remember. And now I'm thinking I should start writing about the people I've worked with over the years and how they affected me and what I learned from them and, and didn't. Some I think it would be a wonderful thing to do because those stories that you're carrying in your head, not only about the people you worked with, about, but about the experiences that you had as a young actor and then maturing through your, throughout your career, those stories should not be lost. They should be preserved. The encouragement. It's, you know, yourself. I'm sure that it's hard to sit down in front of a typewriter and go, oh, now I've got to write something. Once you get going, sometimes it flows. Not always, but it's the getting started that's hard for me to just sit down and start. And I'm thinking now 
I'm going to start writing about people I've worked with or people I wanted to work with and didn't get the job or whatever. But uh, I've written mostly very personal stuff that I'm not even sure should be in a book. It's too personal almost. So, well, maybe when you're not on the stage this summer in Petrolia, I'll come and sit there and I'll interview you and I'll question yeah. you and we'll get it all out. Okay. It's a deal. Are you serious? That's I would crazy. love to do that. Are you kidding? I'm the perfect person to draw out all the wonderful experiences and not so wonderful experiences. Because I think people would love to read about your life, your career, the lessons you've learned, the wisdom you've gained. You know, you've had a long, long career and you've been, from the perspective of the public, you've been beloved. You haven't made a wrong move that, that, that publicly. Well, I've made a lot of wrong moves in my life, but but I've worked hard to make wrong moves right and learn from them, you know? Can you think of a perfect person that you like? No. Nobody likes perfect. I can't think of a perfect person, but I think Nobody that- like a perfect person. <laughs> your, your ability to make those wrong moves and then find a way to make something positive out of them and learn from them is extremely instructive and inspiring for everyone else. So I hope you'll think about it. Well, I will. And thank you for your encouragement. You know, it's, uh, it's hard to sit down and do it. And if I were going to give anybody any advice or wisdom is don't give advice. <laughs> don't give advice to people. They, they don't want it. They want to, they want to do their own thing. And unless somebody asks for it, and then you can share your own experience, I guess. Which is well, great. have you had young people in the industry come to you and ask for guidance and mentorship? Uh, I've coached people. In, mostly in the classics, because a lot of LA actors have never had theater experience. So they're auditioning for a theater role or something, and I've coached them in my living room, but nothing, nothing, uh, nothing really. I would love to teach. I enjoy it. I love seeing somebody make a breakthrough. You know, I did teach a lot when I was part of the company at ACT. And uh, I was teaching people off the street, secretaries and people who were just signing up for a summer program, acting program. And some of them had no talent at all. But every now and then there was one woman who just, she spoke like this. She couldn't, she couldn't speak any louder than this. And I knew she was just so terrified that she, she couldn't get her voice out. And I got her to yell. And the two of us were yelling together and yelling and she was crying. And, you know, that kind of breakthrough for someone is, is very rewarding if you're a teacher or a coach. It's fabulous. And I don't think she ever became an actor, but she broke, broke something inside herself that made her be able to be heard. That wasn't just teaching acting. That was therapy. Kind of. Well, you have to be a bit of a therapist if you're teaching acting, especially. Well, Miss Michael Learned, I must tell you that of all the guests we've had on our show, I have rarely been as excited as I've been to interview you. I've loved you from the very beginning. You'll never know how grateful I am that you took the time to come on our show. Thank you so much for being here. Invite me to Toronto. I'd love to come and see my friends. <laughs> I absolutely will. I love your city. I miss it. Thank you again for being on our show. This was a fun interview. Thank you so much for doing your homework. I appreciate it. Our guest has been the incomparable Michael Learned. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.